I'm just going to start off with like an introduction, but I graduated Cal last year, and I was in Mrs. Hurd's class two years ago, and I remember her telling us if we knew anyone that wanted to come and be a guest speaker to let her know, and right away I thought of Sabrina, but I was kind of like hesitant because of the topic, and it's not really talked about in schools a lot, or even in general, and I went up to her and said, I have a cousin who does speaking at college campuses and high schools about sexual assault. And to me, I thought, even though it wasn't related to child development, that it was important because a lot of us are juniors and seniors, and we're going to be going off to college. And it's something that we all need to know and be aware of. And it's definitely helped me to be more aware, like my first year of college, because I did a research paper my first semester. And um, freshmen, women are most vulnerable in their first three weeks of college, which really stood out to me. So hearing Sabrina speak over and over um, opened my eyes, and I've told my friends about it, and it's just opened everyone else's eyes. So I think it's really great for you guys to hear about it, and I think a lot of times it's really sheltered and not talk, talked about. So I want to introduce Sabrina. How y'all doing? Yeah. last class of the day. Awesome. <coughs> okay, so I am Sabrina Sadler. I, um, <coughs> when I went to high school, went to college, all that good stuff, like my dream was always to have my own daycare one day. Like that was my goal. I loved kids. I wanted to grow up. I was majoring in psychology and child development in college. Um, it's something I really wanted to do, and then in my college experience, something tragic happened being affected by sexual assault, and it changed my life completely. So today, um, sharing my story with you all, um, and at times you may feel anger, sadness, um, pretty much I take you on my roller coaster of emotions um, but while sharing my story. So if at any time anyone needs, like, some fresh air to just get out and step away from it by all means go for it um, it's not an easy topic to hear about talk about any of that um, but it needs to be talked about so um, I am going to share with you all who I am today um, because yes I am a sexual assault survivor but there's a lot more to me than just that piece of me so I am one of those um, crazy people that um, treat their pet, their dog, like a child. Um, and so this is my little Leia, Princess Leia, um, from Star Wars. So um, that's my little baby girl. And then I love the beach. The beach is my getaway place. Like if I'm super stressed down or know something's coming up, I make the effort to plan a trip to get away and go to the day to day or something. And then this is my partner, my best friend, support system, um, go Giants. We love the Giants. Um, and the bottom photos are photos of me with family um, and by myself. But this is my niece and my nephew being silly um, with the unicorn from Despicable Me. It's so fluffy. Um, and then I love running, like running. Um, especially on days like today when I know I'm going to be sharing my story, I make more of the effort to make sure I get up in the morning to go for a run because I know by the day, by the time the day ends, I'm going to be draining. Um, so I need that extra push in the morning. So I love to run. It's the, one of the ways I take care of myself. Um, and I also love Kelly Clarkson. Uh, love her, love her. Uh, and then... My mom and I are the last picture, um, my biggest fan, and um, support person. So that's a little bit about who I am today. Um, and this is um, a saying that I found uh, at one of the high schools that I've spoken to in the past. On the back of their shirts, they have this saying, live a story worth telling. And I think it's really powerful because we all have a different story and it's all worth telling, but we don't always get the opportunity to share it 
um, or wonder, you know, does anyone want to hear our story? Um, but people do want to hear your story, and so it's important to live a story worth telling. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be doing today with you all, is sharing my story. Um, so, growing up, um, I always heard about sexual assault. I saw it on TVs, in movies. Um, it was all around me, but I never really thought it would happen to me. Um, it was something I knew of. Um, and then my junior year in college, um, I became the victim of sexual assault. I became part of the st statistic that one in five college women will be sexually assaulted. Um, and it really, it changed my life um, forever after that. And so I'm gonna share my story with you all. So I'm gonna take you all back to when I was a junior in college. Uh, when I was a junior in college, I was a full-time student taking 15 units. Um, also worked full-time as a nanny and I was also involved in sorority life. So it's pretty busy, always had something going on, not a lot of downtime. And during my, the end of the junior year was graduation season, right? Like you all are coming close to that as well. Um, and so graduation season came and one of my really best good friends were, was graduating from Sac State. And she, um, she graduated that Friday, it was a memorial week, and uh, so we decided, let's go out, let's go out, uh, have some drinks, and see what happens. And so we went out to a local bar, had some drinks, met some guys, invited them back to the apartment. Nothing happened. We all hung out. Um, it was a fine night. Like, we all just hung out. Well, that same weekend, like I said, was memorial weekend. So... My best friend and I, we decided to um, go out, right? It's a three-day weekend. We have an extra night to go out, celebrate, um, and just dance. Um, and so that's what we did. We decided that Sunday we were going to go out. Uh, we ended up going out to a club in downtown Sacramento. We had been there before. We knew people there. Um, it was summer. We felt comfortable. And so the checklist for that night, I had my best friend. Um, both of us made sure we had a designated driver that night because we were both drinking. Um, one of our other friends was going to pick us up when we were ready. Uh, we pre-gamed being a college student. You don't always have a lot of money. And so we pre-drank before going to the club. Um, and then we knew the promoter. And um, once we got inside the club, we had some more drinks. And then we got invited to the VIP area of the club, which being two ladies, we thought, how cool is this? Like, eyes on us, and we get to go up here. And so we went up to the VIP area, and at that point, I was already feeling the alcohol in my system. And so I turned to my best friend and said, hey, I need the lighter drink of the two. Um, and solely based on taste, um, we ended up switching drinks. And after that, my mind goes blank. I do not remember anything after that drink. Um, I ended up going um, missing after that. My Lila, my best friend, she was looking and searching for me all over the club. And usually, we had gone out previous nights. And whenever we go out, we know, like, hey, if I have to go to the bathroom, you're going pee with me. Like, this is something... We do, we know that, and so we've never really left each other before, and so this was unusual. So she's looking for me. Eventually, about 20, 30 minutes later, she finds me outside of the club, uh, and I'm not very responsive. She, and this is all, now I'm going into stuff that I don't remember, so this is stuff that I've heard from her. Um, but she looked at me and she said, like, Bina, I've never seen you like that. And she ended up having to, like, slap my face to kind of get me to respond because I wasn't um, all there. And so because I was so out of it, I wasn't really, my body wasn't working right. I couldn't really get up and walk. And she needed help because it was just her and I. And so there was this couple there that offered to help. And they offered to help take me across the street to the parking garage where we had parked. And so they went up to the second floor with us. 
Um, but in the parking garages, uh, you drive up like the ramp, and so it slanted upwards, and so they were still getting, it was still difficult for them to get me to walk uphill. And so the couple offered to take me back downstairs, wait with me while my friend got the car. At that same time, the club was letting out, so there was all these people in the parking lot, and it took Lila a bit longer to get downstairs. So by the time she got downstairs, I had been missing. Um, she looked everywhere, walked around the club, walked around downtown, and I was nowhere to be found. So she had called my other best friend that was gonna pick us up that night, and um, they both met up. They had eventually needed to file a missing persons report for me, and so they did that. They had to call my mom and tell my mom that I was missing and they didn't know where I was. Um, and my mom had been camping. Um, they had called a couple other people and tried to call hospitals to see where I was found, and I wasn't found until the next morning. Uh, and when I was found, um, there's this gentleman on his way to the Starbucks, and he saw me and felt like something wasn't right. So he stopped and helped me and took me to the local fire department. When he found me, I was, I believe I was pretty much left for dead. Um, I was left in an empty parking lot several miles away from the club as well as I was found naked from the waist down and my face had been badly beaten. So the next picture that I'm gonna show you is a picture of my face after the assault. I'll share that because um, it does bring the reality and I ended up having uh, three broken bones in my face and today I have some screws and plates um, in my face. Um, I had to have reconstructive surgery and whatnot. Um, so I was taken to the fire department and then they took me to the hospital. Meanwhile, my mom found out that they found me. She's rushing to the hospital to be by my side. And by the time she gets to the hospital, my first words to her are, are I'm sorry. Um, because First of all, I think no parent should have to see their child in that type of situation. Um, and I felt like it was my fault what had happened. I chose to go out that night. I chose to drink. I chose to go to a club. Like These were all decisions that I made. Um, so I felt the blame in that moment that it was my fault. And so that's what I said to her. As well as feeling the guilt, all these other emotions came with um, being affected by sexual assault. And so many times those that have been affected by sexual assault or any type of trauma will feel some or all or even more than these emotions. Um, so there was a time that I had guilt and shame that this was my fault. I had to be told over and over and over that it's not my fault to finally believe that it wasn't my fault. Um, there was times where I walked around in fear, thinking, uh, because I didn't remember what happened, and still to this day I don't remember what happened, that this person that did this to me, like, wondering if that person is in my community. Like, does this person know what I look like? When I go to the grocery store, like, I lived in fear, thinking, is this person here? Does this person, is this person watching me? Like, all these different things um, went through my thoughts. Um, I, there's been times where I've been embarrassed about pieces of my story. In the very beginning, it was very, very difficult to say out loud that I was found naked from the waist down. That's embarrassing. I walked in a fire department naked from the waist down. Like, that wasn't easy, but saying my story over and over again, it's helped me and it's made it easier to say out loud. Um, Anxiety, still to this day I have anxiety, and this happened, happened several years ago, um, but this past weekend was Memorial Weekend, and so it's the anniversary of what happened to me, so every Memorial Weekend I try to plan something for me to do, 
like this is my weekend to have my power and control back. Um, but there's times where I, my anxiety kicks in and I try to be aware of that and plan for it. Um, anger, um, definitely been angry throughout this whole process. Uh, sometimes angry at my best friend because she's the one that's next to me. She was there with me that night. Uh, and often it's easier to take out our emotions on the people closest to us than someone I don't know. I don't know this person that did this to me, so how can I be angry at that person if I don't know who they are, right? So it's easier for me to be angry at my best friend, even though this wasn't her fault, but that's just easier for me. And I did, um, I was depressed um, many times as well, and I'm gonna share some of those as well. So that summer, so, that summer, I ended up having to have surgery on my face, um, and I wanted to just get away. I wanted to escape and not face what had happened to me. So I called up everyone I knew across the states and was like, hey, can I come visit you? And I got away. I pretty much ran away from my problems. And so I took, that's what I did that summer, is I just traveled. Um, visited grandparents, my dad, family, friends, um, and went to Hawaii, my happy place. From there, though, uh, the summer always comes to an end eventually, and it was time for school to start back up in the fall. And because I hadn't really faced anything over the summer, what faced and dealt with what had happened to me, I just wanted my life to go back to normal, back how it was before the assault happened. And that meant, you know, continuing to be a full-time student, taking 15 units, um, being a part of sorority life, taking on more responsibilities there, as well as working full-time. Um, I think I even took on more responsibilities that fall than I had previously had in previous semesters because I was trying to distract myself from what had really happened. Um, so midway through the semester uh, was my birthday. Um, and my birthday fell on the same day as Causeway Classic, which is a big football game we have um, at Sac State, between Sac State and UC Davis. Um, and so I told all my friends, let's go to the football game during the day. And then at night, we can all come back to our house and have a party. So we went to the game. Everything was fine. We had fun that night. We had people over um, for my birthday celebration, and um, that's when everything kind of went downhill. Um, this is a picture from me of me from that night, um, and that night I was just taking pretty much shot after shot after shot uh, because I was so numb and I hadn't been facing what I was dealing with that I turned to alcohol instead. And alcohol in that moment was helping me not face what I needed to face. And so that night I ended up hurting pretty much everyone in my life that was important to me at that time. Uh, one of my best friends that had drove every day to be by my side after the assault, uh, I got in a huge argument with her um, and our friendship has never been the same since. Um, my best friend that was with me the night of the assault, she was standing right next to me and I was in a conversation with someone and I was just talking crap about her as she was standing right next to me. Uh, but I was so drunk that I didn't realize what I was doing. Um, my best guy friend, he came that night, I didn't say one word to him. Um, luckily he stuck around because um, he's now my husband. Um, so I value that, but that night I ended up um, passing out because of all the alcohol that was in my system. The next morning I woke up and I had to ask my roommates, what happened last night? Why do I have people mad at me? What's going on? And they told me what had happened and I couldn't, I couldn't remember any of this. And so I was kind of in shock. but. It was my wake-up call that I need to do something different, uh, and I had to make a choice. Um, 
it was either I continue down this path and don't face what happened to me and turn to alcohol, turn to unhealthy habits, or do I get help? Uh, and I decided that I needed to get help. And I decided to speak out and share my story. And so over the summer after the assault had happened, I, um, I remember a sister, a friend telling me, hey, Sabrina, there's this advocate on campus. Uh, if you ever need someone to talk to, she's available. At the time when my friend told me this, I wasn't really open to getting help. And so I wasn't into it at that moment. But now, after all the stuff that happened at my birthday party, I was more open to getting help. And so I contacted that friend and said, hey, who is that advocate you were telling me about? So I contacted the advocate, met with the advocate, um, didn't, really want him to, didn't want to really be there, but I knew I needed to be there. And so meeting with the advocate, I then started one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, which wasn't easy, but I started it. Um, I then became a peer health educator on my campus, being a resource for my peers. Um, and then on college campuses and in the community sometimes, there's these events called Take Back the Night. And it's a night, it's an event that survivors of sexual violence can come out and share their story. And it's them taking back what happened to them and speaking open about it. And so I told the advocate on my campus that I want to speak at this event. And so uh, a little less than a year after my assault, I spoke publicly to all my peers um, and shared my story about surviving sexual assault. Uh, and it was one of the most empowering days uh, of my life just because I felt like I didn't have to keep this secret in anymore. And I got to share it and I got support afterwards. Um, and so these two pictures are from that day. I had both men and women supporting me. Um, the room that I spoke in, it was packed. People were sitting on the floor. Um, it was an amazing feeling. And from this, just by me choosing to speak out, after that, I would get random text messages or phone calls saying, hey, Sabrina, can you meet up with me or can you meet up with my friend? Um, and eventually, like all these people ended up sharing their story with me. So that one in five statistic was no longer just a statistic to me. Like I saw all these different people's faces of this is what sexual assault looks like. And one story that I'll share, um, but I, I don't know if I've shared here before, but um, so there was a, one of my friends, she texted me and said, hey, can you meet up with a really good friend of mine? And I was like, sure, because uh, I believe in the cause, I'm passionate about all this stuff. So um, I'm texting this girl and uh, I'm going to her house. I don't know who this is. I'm walking into her apartment. I don't know where I am. I'm just taking this leap um, and hoping every everything is okay. Um, so I get there. Um, never met this girl before. She has me, I sit down in her room and she hands me this letter. Um, she was part of a sorority and she had written this letter to tell her sorority sisters. And she hands me this letter and I read it. And I'm reading it and it shares how she was sexually assaulted in high school. And how she cuts herself and reading it I had never dealt with like yeah I've heard people share their stories in themselves and so that was new to me but reading her letter I understood why she did it it was a way for her to relieve her pain and in that moment I just thought how amazing is she for letting me read this opening up and letting me read this letter that was meant to be for her sisters and she doesn't even know me um, and so like I will forever remember that story because it's when we share our stories we never know the connections that we will make um, but often our stories are silenced and um, this one girl just opened my eyes to you know why people may cut themselves and different things and so it was really powerful and it's all in all because I shared my story one time with my peers.
um, something to think about. Um, as well as seeking out being a peer health educator, um, I was also I was involved a lot in college, and one of the stories we came across when I was a college student was a, a story that happened at Danza College, which makes it that much more difficult to report it to the police. As well as most of the time, there's no physical bruises or anything like that. And that makes it even more difficult. Because if in the media, if we always see a rape victim, a sexual assault victim with bruises, and we never see one without bruises, then if I've been sexually assaulted and I don't have bruise, or yeah, I don't have bruises, I may question that. So our media, the media sends us mixed messages as well. So like I said, the majority of sexual assaults happen by someone we know. Um, which means it could be classmates, friends, ex-partners, um, be a variety of people. But majority of sexual assaults do happen by someone we know and we trust. Um, in 85% of sexual assaults, there is no weapon. So there's no gun, there's no knife, right? Especially if most of sexual assaults happen by someone we know and we trust, chances are our guard is down when they're around because we trust them. You know, and they're taking advantage of us. Um, so they don't need a, vent, a weapon. Um, how many of you have been taught to, like, never leave your drink behind or cover your drink, right? We get taught all these things. Um, it, and it's frustrating because shouldn't we be teaching just don't rape versus mm -hmm. all the things that we shouldn't be doing to not get raped? Um, but I'm a fan of, you know, don't leave your drink behind, cover your drink, all that stuff. But that drink, if that drink has alcohol in it, that drink in itself is a drug that can be used to facilitate sexual assault. Alcohol is the number one drug used to facilitate a sexual assault. But we don't always realize that. We always get scared of, oh, you don't want someone to put something into your drink, right? Uh, but that drink can actually be used as that for that as well. Uh, and it's, you know, you're at a party and someone sees, oh, your cup's getting low, let me refill your cup for you. Oh, let's go take some shots together. Let's take them together. You know, they're trying to get you more intoxicated because they have a plan. They want to make you vulnerable to take advantage of you. But we don't always think like that because... We're at a party, we were, we're with friends, we're having a good time, there's no reason why I need my guard up, I trust everyone here, but it goes back to the majority of sexual assaults happen by someone we know and we trust. And so we're not gonna think twice about taking a shot, a couple of shots with a friend. Um, right, that's boys and girls, that's before the age of 18. That's a lot, and yet we don't always talk about these topics. So that sexual assault, consent. So consent is permission, saying yes. So every person has a right to safe, healthy, legal sexual activities. Um, so what is consent? How do you know if someone's consenting, right? So if you are going to engage in any sexual activity with anyone, you need to ask for their permission to do that. If you want to have sex with someone, you need to ask them, do you want to have sex with me? Whatever, you can add your own flavor to it, whatever, and ask it in your way, but you need to ask for their permission. And then you want, you want an enthousi enthusiastic consent in return. If you ask someone, oh hey, like you want to have sex, whatever the way you're going to ask, and they're just like, yeah, sure. Do you really want to have sex with someone that responds that way? Chances are it's not going to be a good experience. What you need to look for is looking for someone enthusiastic about having sex with you. You want someone, whether it's you looking for someone to have sex or if you want to have sex with someone, you need to be enthusiastic. You need to say, hell yeah, I want you. Right? That's what you're looking for because then you know that person is serious, that they do really want to do this. That there's not, they're not feeling pressured. And this little conversation that I'm talking about, I'm not saying like go on and have sex. 
That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you are going to engage in sexual activities, you need to ask for consent. It's really important. And it's important that you have that hell yes, because the next day, you don't want a text of someone regretting what they did the day before. Right? If you have someone that's like, hell yes, I want to do this with you, at least you know in that moment they really wanted to do that. And if you are not getting that 100% enthusiastic yes, then you should walk away. That can wait. That's really, really important to know. Um, consent is an agreement between people before they engage in any kind of sexual activity. Both people have to say yes clearly and freely. So legally, if you are under 18, you cannot give consent. Right? So when you go on a field trip or you're traveling for school, your parents, guardian, have to usually, usually sign a permission slip for you, right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Because you're under age. Legally, if you're under 18, you can't give consent. So legally, anyone under 18 should not be having sex because they cannot give consent. Are people under 18 having sex? Yes. Um, so one thing that I have seen come up, because I work with um, high school students and stuff, um, I've had students share with me that they were in a relationship with someone. Um, this was a young, um, young guy. He was in a relationship with a girl. He was dating her. They were having consensual sex. Um, and her parents found out. And her parents weren't happy, so they ended up filing charges against him. Um, and he ended up having to go to juvenile hall for a little bit. Um, and so that's a, one example of what could happen. Um, if you are under 18 and having sex and parents find out, or there's other dynamics as well, but that's just one example that I ran into. Um, and what if, if his parents file charges against the girl in that situation. Who's more likely to have charges filed upon them, the guy or the girl? The guy, right? Because we often see the guys as the perpetrator, um, the offender, all of that. Um, so yeah. Um, everyone has the right to change their mind at any time. So if I text my partner, and say, you know, tonight I want to do this, this, and this to you, and then tonight comes, and I'm with my partner, and I decided, no, I really don't want to do this, I have every right to change my mind. Every right. Each one of us has every right to change our mind. Just because we said we were going to do something, doesn't matter. Even if you're like fully engaged in having sex with someone and you change your mind, it needs to stop. And that's what a healthy relationship is, having your partner respect you. You change your mind. Even if you've had sex with someone a hundred times, and if on that one hundred and one time, you don't want to have sex or they don't want to have sex, that is your individual choice. And it should be respected. Think about like a relationship at high school. Say if a freshman is dating a senior. Is there a power dynamic there? Right? Could that freshman maybe feel pressured and not feel comfortable saying no to that senior? Absolutely, right? That freshman may feel pressured in being cool, or I really like this person, um, all that stuff. There's a power dynamic. And so sometimes, depending who we're with, there may be a power dynamic. We may be the ones with more power, they may, but we need to be aware of that. And make sure that whatever sexual activity we're engaged in, that we ask for permission. And it's probably uncomfortable because it's something like, we don't talk about sex, but we just do it, or whatever it may be. But if you can't ask your partner an open question like that, then you probably shouldn't even be having sex with them or doing that sexual activity if you can't talk about it. Bottom line. Um, and sexual activity without consent is sexual assault. 
So, hold on one sec. Um, if someone's under the influence of alcohol or other drugs, they cannot legally give consent either. So oftentimes you go to a party, there's alcohol, um, people may have been drinking, and then people go home, leave together, hook up, whatever, but legally, none of us can give consent while under the influence. And why would that be? Mm -hmm. It affects our judgment, we're not thinking clearly, all of that stuff. Question. So, just wondering, if you're married and you kind of don't want to have sex, and like, would you still be able to file for a sexual assault even if you're married? Is that um, like, is that good like, question. Yeah. Just because I'm married to someone mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they can have sex with me whenever they want. Um, they, a uh, husband, wife, any of that um, can still, just because you're married to someone, um, you can still charge sexual assault against them, especially with like dating violence, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a weapon that the abuser will use of sexual assaulting their partner um, as a weapon to take advantage of them. So it does happen, but we don't think, like how can you sexually assault your husband? How can you sexually assault your wife, your partner, all of this stuff? But you can't. There's the pressure, there's the power dynamic, all of these different things, and so that's a really good question. Um, an important question because uh, you, some people may not think that that's possible, but it is. Yeah. And sometimes, even if you're dating for, dating someone and you've had sex with them, and then they sexually assaulted you, a person may be in denial of like, did this really happen, did this not happen, like, I've had sex with them before, so does this mean that I was raped? All these different questions can go through someone's mind, and so that, that's the challenge of reporting it, is because there's so many layers, and this is my husband, this is my wife, uh, that can't be sexually assault, sexual assault, because that's my duty, you know? It's all um, that stuff, but it does happen. So, uh, consent. So if you all have more questions, um, just let me know. Okay. Um, so I've been sharing with you all my college experience with sexual assault, but the reality is sexual assault also happens at the middle school level, uh, high school level. Uh, it's not just a college thing. So these are two cases um, that happened last fall uh, that I wanted to just touch on. And um, so one is Steubenville, Ohio. So Steubenville, Ohio is a small football town um, the, some of the football players there had a party. There was alcohol involved. This um, young woman, she was from like a neighboring town, came over to the party, drank a lot, passed out. Um, this is a picture that two of the football players posted on social media. Um, she's passed out. Um, and a little bit later after this photo, they, one guy in particular, um, but all the rest of them were in the video, made a video talking about um, how dead she was and how they raped her. And they posted this on social media. <coughs> this is in a high school. Um, and in that case, there was a lot of backlash against the victim, saying that she is ruining the future of these football players, um, all this stuff. Um, when not many people were thinking about her and how her life now will be changed forever. Um, it was just all about these boys and how their life will be changed. But the judge in this county, um, I think he's really awesome because he felt that it was really important to address this issue and he ended up holding court for these two young men over the weekend, which court is usually only open Monday through Friday. So to have it on a Saturday or Sunday speaks volumes about this is something that's really important and we're not going to tolerate in our community. Uh -huh. So that's that one. Um, Jada, um, there was a hashtag created um, called has hashtag Jada Pose. And Jada had went to a party, had been drinking a little bit, and uh, she ended up passing out, but the way she passed out, like her body was in a certain pose, and someone took a picture of her, posted on social media, 
and put hashtag data post. And so people then at her school, other people in the community started recreating that picture, doing the data pose. Um, and so that was re-traumatizing to her and making fun of her. Um, and someone violated her by taking that picture and posting it on social media. Um, and so in reaction to that, um, the I am Jada hashtag was created in support of Jada, that we support you. Um, and that it's not okay just to take pictures of vulnerable people and post them all over social media. Um, have you all ever heard um, of the name Amanda Todd? Yes, yes. okay. Um, so Amanda Todd is another example of um, cyberbullying, sexual violence, all that stuff. But Amanda Todd, so I was actually working, uh, I was presenting at one of my schools in Venetia, and they were talking about Amanda Todd, and I was listening to what they were saying, and they were saying like these horrible things of like, she deserves this, da 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 And I'm like thinking, who is this Amanda Todd? So I went back to my office, and I'm Googling Amanda Todd. And the way that they were talking about Amanda Todd, I felt like she was someone from our community um, because they were talking about it like they knew the ins and outs of her story. And so come to find out, she's a young, she's a teenage girl from Canada. Um, she made a video on YouTube telling her story um, and she did end up committing suicide. Um, and what had happened is she had formed a relationship um, with a guy online. They had a, relation, a friendship relationship. He eventually asked her to take a picture of her breast and send it to him. She said no, no, no. He kept trying, trying, trying. Eventually she did. Um, he ended up spreading that picture out to a lot of people, people at her school. Um, so she ended up getting bullied for that. Um, she tried committing suicide a handful of times um, and then there was this boy that she started talking to um, had sex with he ended up having a girlfriend um, that girlfriend confronted her at school um, they got in a physical fight uh, and she ended up um, committing suicide um, but what I found fascinating with all this is going back to those students at Phoenicia High, how they were talking about she deserves this, you know, she's the one that put those pictures out there, all of this stuff. But turns out that this guy that asked for these pictures was much older than her, much older, like 20s, 30s. Like he knew what he was doing. He was violating her, taking advantage of her. And we don't often see the whole picture. We just see these bits and pieces on social media and we make our judgments of, you know, we may see this picture and call this girl a slut. But really, what is going on in that picture? Are we taking a look at the big picture, not just what we see in front of us? And so I challenge you all to, because we're a culture that we judge and I'm guilty of judging, but think more into something. Don't always, if someone's saying, oh, someone's so slut or this or that. Because ladies, let me tell you, us, all of us, we are sometimes our hardest critics. We are really mean and evil to each other when really we should be on the same team. We should be supporting each other and lifting each other up versus tearing each other down. Um, but these are just two stories that I want to share. And, um, I always remember Amanda Chop's story, so thanks for letting me share that. Um, so being that I'm talking about sexual assault, and um, chances are I, you all are my third class I've spoken to today, and within those three classes, I know the statistics, and chances are there's students that have been affected by sexual assault um, that have heard my story today. And so I just want to make you all aware of um, what's out there as resources and support. Um, so if you have been affected by sexual assault, I want you to know that it's not your fault and that you're not alone. Um, oftentimes we feel like we're alone, but we're really not. Um, and you have options. 
So some of the options that you do have is you don't have to face this on your own. There's a time that I didn't want to deal with what had happened to me. I was ready to move on, wanted my life to go back to normal. But the reality is I needed to face what happened to me and I wouldn't have been able to face all of that if it wasn't for my family and my friends supporting me. I needed them to be where I am today. Um, you can also report it to the police. Um, if you have a friend that's been affected by sexual assault, I encourage you not to pressure them into reporting it to the police. Um, let them make that decision. Um, even myself, I reported to the police, but I would never pressure uh, another victim of sexual assault to report it to the police. That's their individual choice because sexual violence is about power and control. One person using their power to control the other and part of healing and becoming transforming into a survivor is having that victim be empowered to make their own decisions. And so you can say, hey, if you do want to report it, I'll be there to support you. Um, another piece is use resources. There's tons of resources in our community, in our schools, that you can use. Um, so look for those, as well as get medical attention. It's really important. You never know what internal trauma may be happening after a sexual assault, what other trauma could happen, and so it's really important to seek medical attention, um, whether it's for SDIs or anything like that. Um, and then I end with this quote on this slide. It's one of my favorite quotes um, that I got from a student at a high school. Um, after they heard my story, they wrote this on a little note card for me. Two years ago, I battled with depression. And like you, I didn't want to ask for help. I thought it would just go away on its own. I realize now that asking for help doesn't make me weak. It makes me human. I think that speaks volumes that oftentimes we think by asking for help, we think it's weak, but really asking for help means that we're brave enough to ask for that. Uh, and no matter what our challenges are in life, whether it's you know something like sexual assault or something else, ask for help. Like we're all in the same community and we should all be able to help each other. Uh, so that's really important. Um, but it can be a scary process to ask for help as well. Uh, so how can you help a friend? Um, these three, first three bullets are the most important. Um, especially the first one is if you have ever had a friend or in the future if you have a friend that comes to you and says, I've been affected by sexual assault or something happened last night, whatever it may be, the most important thing you could tell them is it's not their fault. What were my first words to my mom? I'm sorry. Because I felt like it was my fault that I put that myself in that situation. But the reality is, is it wasn't my fault. I had went out two nights before that night with my other friend, had alcohol, we invited guys back to our apartment, but nothing happened that night. The difference between that night and the night that I was sexually assaulted is that there was someone there that wanted to take advantage of me. And that did. And so telling your friend, <coughs> telling them it's not your fault is one of the most important things you could tell them. Because oftentimes when someone tells us something, we have more questions or we want to make statements, right? We want to give our personal input about it, right? Well, did you leave them on? What were you doing? Didn't you know this would happen? Like, we want to say all these things, but the reality is those things aren't going to help the situation. And if those questions or those comments, if those are our first reactions to someone sharing that with us, they may never ever tell anyone else because of the reaction we gave them that first time. So it's really important to tell them it's not your fault and that you believe them. and that they're not alone. Oftentimes, no matter what it is, like some of you could be stressing about grades for the end of the semester, however big or little thing it is in our life that we're going through, we often feel alone. But really, there's other people in this classroom, outside of this classroom, that are going through the same thing. But we don't talk about these tough things. 
Most of us are not alone when it comes to situations that we're feeling. And provide options. Never pressure uh, a victim of sexual violence to do this, to do that. You know, if they're going into unhealthy habits like drinking or certain things, there's ways to go about it, but don't back them in a corner and force them to make decisions because it's about empowering them to get that power and control back. These are some resources available for y'all. You can go contact school counselors. Sometimes that may not be um, you guys write these down? Uh, appropriate for you, or you may not feel comfortable doing that. Every county in California has a rape crisis center. For Contra Costa, it is Community Violence Solutions, and they have a 24-hour crisis line that you or a friend can call and ask questions, um, get information. And then there's also the national hotline as well. But this is one that I want to touch on. Has anyone ever seen this teal circle anywhere? No? So this is the logo for uh, bringing it into domestic violence and sexual assault. How many of you have seen the pink ribbon? Right? What does that stand for? Breast cancer. Breast cancer, right? So the goal with this is to get this out just as much as that pink ribbon, right? Um, sexual, sexual assault, domestic violence, um, it happens to everyone and anyone. And so this is something we need to be talking about. And so they've done some really cool projects. They showed a commercial during, during the Super Bowl this year. Um, so it's growing. Um, my wish is hopefully one day, um, like some of these professional sports teams, they wear the pink cleats. Um, during October and all that stuff, I hope that they'll, they will wear teal cleats um, in support of this because it does happen everywhere. Um, and this is one of my quotes that I love. Uh, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Um, oftentimes we think we may not have as much power as we do, but each one of us in this room, we have power. Some of us more than others. Um, but we each have power, and we can use that power in a good way. Um, so I encourage you all to use that um, in one way or the other. So what do you stand for? Um, these are some takeaways that you can take away today. Um, I hope that the conversation, me coming and sharing my story with you all, does not end in this classroom. I hope that you carry the conversation outside of this classroom and bring more awareness. Um, so use your voice. Your voice is very powerful. Um, and I'll share a story in a minute about using your voice. But also being a self-defense instructor, I've learned the power that my voice has and that I'm willing to use uh, to say what I feel comfortable with, what I don't feel comfortable with, uh, is really important. So one thing you can do is leave today and tell someone about this presentation. That's something simple you can do. But I understand that sexual violence is uncomfortable, so that may be a challenge as well. Um, listen to your gut. When something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't, right? With the Danza girls, they felt like something wasn't right and they did something about it. We don't all have to be that extreme, but listen to that gut. That gut feeling is our internal alarm system. It's there for a reason. And so I encourage you to use it. Speak up when you hear inappropriate jokes. Um, vision a world without sexual violence. That's my vision. People may say I'm crazy, but that's why I do what I do. That's why I share my story. Um, and care for the cause. This is an issue that affects each one of us in this room. 
You may not think it affects you, you may think it will never affect you, but one thing I promise you, that each one of us in this room, we all have someone in our life that has been affected by sexual violence. They may have not told us, but we all have someone that's been affected by sexual violence. By me sharing my story, I've learned that my mom, my grandma, my best friends have all been affected by sexual violence. And that's just not my family. That's every family. It's something we need to bring light to and talk about. So, every voice matters. I was encouraging you all to use your voice. So, one example of me using my voice is um, my husband is a part of different fantasy football games, whatever those things are called. Um, so, he's on, he has three different leagues that he's a part of. And so with fantasy football, you pick players from different football teams, um, and that's your team, and then you get points every week. And so with these, um, with your team, you come up with a team name. Um, and so I don't really pay much detail to all that stuff, but um, this one night we were going out, we were celebrating a friend's birthday, and some of the guys that he is in a fantasy football league with, they were all talking about one of the other guys' team names. And one of the guys said, oh yeah, his team name is Rape is Good. And I was standing there in shock, thinking, why didn't any of these guys speak up? Why didn't my husband speak up? and call this other guy out and say, that's not cool. So I was frustrated, I was feeling all these different things, and then I just decided, you know what, because this guy who had that as the team name was there that night, so I decided, no, I'm just going to go up to him and say something to him. So I went up to him, and all I said was, your fantasy football team. He knew exactly what I was talking about, and within seconds he changed that name. But it just took someone speaking up, using their voice. Imagine if we all used our voice in moments like that. It would be a better world. We're holding people accountable. And so I encourage you all, if something like that happens, it doesn't have to be just about sexual assault or rape. But if something happens and it's, you know, you shouldn't be saying that, whatever, call them out. They need that accountability. But it can be scary. But the more you do it, the more practice you get, the easier it, it goes. So, this picture. Um, this picture has a lot of meaning to me. Um, and on it is lyrics from Kelly Clarkson's song Stronger, because I love Kelly Clarkson. And it's the song Stronger uh, stands for everything that I stand for. Um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Stand a little taller. Doesn't mean I'm lonely. When I'm alone, what doesn't kill you makes you a fighter. Footsteps even lighter. Um, I never imagined to be on this path. I always imagined to have my daycare, work with little kids. That was my vision, my life goals. But this incident, being affected by sexual assault, drastically changed that and put me on a new path. And I'm determined to bring education, bring awareness about sexual assault because it is something we don't talk about. It's something that we're uncomfortable talking about, but we need to talk about it. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, how was I able to move on from my case, right, being that he was found not guilty? I don't put, I try not to put my energy into that piece. I try not to put my energy obsessing over who this person is because I can't control that. The one thing I can control is my voice and my story and who I tell it to. And so that's why I go to high schools, I go to college campuses sharing my story because I believe in the impact that it makes. We need to shine the light on this. Um, and so with this picture, I went to a friend, it was one of my friends, who was starting off with photography, and I said, I want to feel like I'm on top of the world. I want to feel like I'm a survivor. And so she did some research, found a place. I didn't know where we were going until the day of. We were going all around downtown, taking different photos, and this was the last location. We parked. We're walking up to this parking garage, and it's the same parking garage 
that I was taken from the night that I was sexually assaulted. Um, so different emotions came over me and it was a full circle moment to be where I was taken from that night and to be back there strong as ever and just be on top of feeling like I'm on top of the world. And so this picture, everyone may initially look at it and have their own interpretation, but that's what the picture means to me. It says, it speaks volumes to me and is very meaningful. So that, um, that concludes my presentation. One of my future projects that I'm working on um, that I'll be kicking off in June is I'm going to be going back and um, interviewing my best friend, um, family members, people that were have been around me through this whole healing process and get their perspective of what happened because when I come here and share my story with you all, I'm only sharing my story, but the reality is the sexual assault didn't just affect me. It affected my whole entire family and friends, and so eventually I want to share our story. So one day, hopefully, I'll be here sharing that. So yeah, thank you.